Hi, this is Randy Finney with Right Side of the Chart, and today is Tuesday, January 5th, 2016. I wanted to start off by wishing everybody a very happy and prosperous new year in 2016. Um, and what I plan to do today in this video is take a look, a quick look at where, we, where we're coming from, what happened in 2015, um, and then spend some time on where I think we're headed. Uh, and, and what I'm talking about here uh, t and today in this video in particular will be the U.S. equity markets. Uh, I do plan to do some separate videos on gold, silver, and the mining stocks, as well as commodities. Uh, and I'd like to do one on global uh, global stock markets, you know, the non-U.S. markets. Uh, hopefully wrap those up by the end of this week, if possible. So what we're looking at here, I've actually posted this article in the trading room last night. This was published on CNBC on uh, uh, January th or yeah December 31st, uh, stating that 2015 was the hardest year to make money in 78 years, and uh, what they're referring to there is all asset classes had either flat to negative returns, and that's the first time we've seen such a you know a market that was so hard to make money. Now, keep in mind, and this is this is why I'm doing this video, and this is why we're all here. 2015 was a trader's market. There was money to be made in the mar market, just not for buy and hold investors. In other words, buy and hold investors, 2006 or 2009, from the, when the market's bottom in March of 2009, through all the way through 2014, the market did nothing but go straight up. There were some pretty sharp corrections, and there were definitely some trades to be made on both long and short side. But for the most part, um, you could have just parked all your money in an in a index fund and done very well. Uh, that wasn't the case in 2015. And even if you pulled it out of stocks and you put it into bonds, cash, commodities, uh, you either made virtually nothing or you lost money. And again, I'm referring to buy and hold investing. So uh, I think the easy money, I think it's safe to be uh, safe to say, uh, has been made uh, as far as buy and hold investing goes. And my belief is that 2016 will be even harder for a buy and hold investor, especially those that are usually putting most or all of their money into stocks. I, uh, I'll get into that because we're going to spend most of the time on the outlook of the markets going forward. Uh, but I did want to point that out, and um, we'll take a look at uh, a couple things here. Uh, let's look at the duration of this bull market, and then we'll, we'll we'll take a look at the charts here in a minute. This is an article from CNN Money. This goes back, this article was published back in May, so it's a little bit dated. And at that time, back in May, they were talking about the bull market, how we were already, uh, this was the th third longest running bull market in history uh, from 2009 at 2,250 days. Uh, again, I, I said this was done, this article was published back in May. So what I did is I calculated, you can just Google anything, uh, calculate duration between two dates. You go on the internet and they'll have calendars you plug in. This bull market started back on March 6, 2009. So through today, assuming we're still in the bull market, because technically we have not dropped 20% off the highs, uh, although I, I think a strong case can be made that the, the bull has seen its better days and, and we've likely embarked on a new bear market and that we will at some point in 2016 be 20% 20, 20 or more off the highs that we put in, in in 2015. But what I wanted to point out here is we're about 2,500 days, 2,497 days uh, through today if if this bull market is still alive and it's going to go longer. So, uh, you know, for, you know, we keep going for a few more months, we will then be at the second uh, longest bull market uh, in history. Uh, this 1987 to 2000, I, I, I don't really agree with that number. You can look at a chart, and yes, stocks did go up from 87 to 2000, but we had a dear market where it w in there in the early 90s where stocks traded really flat to sideways. A deer market is really between a bull and a bear market, and I've talked on those before. It's a term used uh, for a, a sideways market. So uh, the real advance, uh, the bull market that led up to the 2000 highs, in my opinion, was launched in 1994. That's when, if you take a look at the charts, stocks took off. There's a well-defined trend line, and uh, I'll cover that in the charts. So I just wanted to point out the fact that bull markets don't last forever. And in trading, uh, and what I'm doing here is making a case 
both here from a time perspective that we've already, this bull market is very long in the tooth. Um, and most importantly, we'll look at the charts here in a second. Um, but let's look at, you know, how to profit from this because if we're, let's just say we have another 2015 where the market goes up, it goes down, we have some nice rips, but it ends up flat. I do think stocks will be down quite a bit by in calendar year 2016. Um, but if, even if they're not, this is what we do, uh, or at least this is what I do on the site here. I trade long and short. If you go to the completed uh, trades, right now we're looking at the short completed trades for 2015. You hover under trade ideas. Uh, I'm going to, where my mouse is right now, my cursor is off to the right hand side. But if you hover on the box, there's a category for long trades that are completed, short trades that are completed. These are all the short trades for 2015. And these total, if you count them out, 69 trades. I do need to say there is some redundancy here because uh, due to the way I, the posts are categorized, if I make a post on the QQQ, which is the tracking ETF for the NASDAQ 100, I'll also tag that with NDX. And if I, let's say in some cases, I might make a short-term trade. So I'll use a leverage of the, uh, an ETF like TQQQ, which is a three time long. Uh, that post and all associated posts with that trade will also be tagged with the NDX and QQQ. Now, the reason I do that, if somebody comes into the site and I have that archiving system or the categories, uh, the categories uh, that are assigned uh, the, with these symbol tags. So if somebody wants to take a look at all my analysis on the NDX, they might pull up that symbol and they therefore they should see any posts that have charts on the QQQ, even if I'm using a chart on TQQQ because those are all related. So uh, I just wanted to point that out. So with that being said, again, 69 short trades. If you back out the fact that uh, some of these were really the same trade. That brings you down to, I don't know, I didn't count it out, probably about 60 trades. Now, let me go over here and click on the long trades. And what I'm getting at is, remember, again, 2015, essentially, from the beginning 10, was a flat year. Um, but as we all know, the markets didn't flatline the entire year. There were some quite a few rips and quite a few dips and they were very tradable um, very you know profitable to trade so these are the long trade ideas and there's a total of 75 once again a few symbols if you look up here for example uh, let's see here's GDX and there's nugget and dust as most of you know if I'm trading the miners I'll use nugget or dust for leverage if it's a quick trade I'll use and I want to go long I'll use nugget um, and if it's a let's say a I want to go long the miners, but I think I might be in that trade for more than just a few days. I'll short dust. That way that decay that these ETFs have works in my favor. Therefore, these trades are sometimes, again, they're going to be tagged GDX and dust at the same time. If I'm trading dust, I'll include that GDX. So again, back out, we're probably right around where we were. I had 75, total 75 longs right here, and I had a total of 69 shorts last year. And uh, that would really make sense for that market. Now, going forward in 2016, I'll always keep a balance of longs and shorts. And even if we do have a bear market in equities, remember, we may have a, we could have easily have a strong bull market in gold, gold mining stocks, oil. At some point, oil is going to bottom. That is a commodity. You know, companies can go bankrupt. Companies can go to zero. Gold and oil they have a tangible value. They're never going to go to zero. And they've certainly had the snot beat out of them in the last few years. So uh, I think there'll be opportunities on the long side. And even for those of you that, that prefer to trade stocks, let's assume that I'm right. In 2016, we do see a bear market. There are going to be plenty of counter trend rallies. And for those of you that have followed the site for some time, you know I'm an equal opportunity trader, long, short. Uh, even if I have a bearish bias and I short the the cues, I'm going to cover it support. And if it's a good support level, like like on the October lows, we, we reversed that day. I went from short, covered the shorts, went long for the bounce. Um, that's what we'll be doing in 2016. And uh, of course, if the charts change and something convinces me that this market's going to go to new highs um, and that there's more life in the bull market, um, then the bias, my bias will shift over to a long, long bias. But uh, as always, you'll see long and short trades on the site. I just wanted to point that out and uh, also point out the fact that 
2016 will most likely be a trader's market. Good for swing traders, um, probably not so good for trend traders, and certainly not for investors. At least that's the way uh, I'm reading the charts now. So let's go ahead. Enough of that. Let's jump into the charts, and uh, let me get on the different chart. Okay, to keep this video relatively short, I don't want to go on forever. I won't cover every single index in the U.S. I'm, I'll touch on, on, on some of the major ones. Uh, however, let's focus, let's start out here and focus on the Wilshire. The Wilshire 5000 is the most representative index for really the, the, the entire stock market. You know, you have all different size companies, small, medium, large, uh, whereas the S&P 500 are only your large caps, um, the NASDAQ, uh, NDX 100, which is popularly followed, doesn't even own financial, doesn't hold financial stocks. It's really not representative of the U.S. economy. It's, as we all know, very tech heavy. It's made up a lot of tech and biotech stocks. Uh, the Dow, every, you know, they, they've been for years and years and years. That's what they talk about on when you hear, uh, you turn on the evening news, they talk about what the Dow's done. Dow's up this much or that much. It's only 30 stocks. As we all know, 30 stocks is not truly representative of how the whole economy is doing. Uh, so uh, that's why we're looking at the Wilshire. Uh, we can look at the other charts. And the story is the same. As I posted many, many times, you know, these are first and foremost, I put probably the biggest weighting into these trend lines in a chart like this. Now, again, we're looking at a span of over 20 years here. These are the last three bull and bear markets, at least the last two bear markets. And in just about every instance, you can define these bull markets with a, a fairly well-defined uptrend line. Um, you know, the market tops. You, you don't know you're in a bear market until your first first sign comes when you have a break of those uptrend lines. Um, you know, you'll see a couple pierces here. I talk about a lot uh, this these shadows or wicks on these candles uh, like you have right here. But prices manage to close back up. And in most cases, you'll see that. So you get these quick breakdowns. But once you have a solid breakdown, um, it's pretty safe to say that uptrend is over. Now, trend lines in themselves... Uh, you know, there's not any one standalone, uh, you know, indicator that's 100% accurate, but I, I put a lot of weighting into these divergences here. So we had, in every case, we have these divergent tops. Up, up here we have the RSI, and you can see the negative divergence. In other words, the RSI making a series of lower highs within the PPO down here. I use the PPO on a weekly time frame in lieu of the MACD. It works a little bit better when you're looking at very long-term uh, price charts, especially with large price swings. Um, but other than that, it works in a very similar fashion to the MACD. So you have divergent tops, divergent tops in every case here. And these really take the form of large uh, bearish rising wedge patterns. Uh, so this chart speaks volumes to me. The S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ composite, the mid caps, small caps, they've all broken down similar. They all have similar uptrend, bull market uptrend lines. They all had divergent highs and they've all broken down. So this probably more than anything in itself tells me that more than likely the great bull market from 2009 to 2015 is more than likely over and it's most likely seen its best days. Although anything is possible, I'll keep my options open, but I'll make it, you know, clear. I don't, I'm not one for ambiguous analysis, uh, but I would be a fool to sit here and say that there's no way we're going to make new highs. If, if the charts tell me otherwise, um, then in my outlook, you know, my longer term outlook might change. Now, and, and keep in mind, this is my longer term, term outlook. It helps formulate the trades that I'm looking for, the way I'm going to position, uh, which price targets I'll hold out for on those trades. Um, but at the end of the day, I focus mainly on trading individual stocks, the best looking setups, long or short. I don't care if we're in a bull or bear market, as I just showed with, you know, the uh, roughly equal number of long and short trades in 2015. And that's, you go back in time and you'll you'll typically see that as well. So that's that's what we're looking at here. I could, I could look at some other charts. Um, and we'll do that real quick. We'll look at one or other one or two other indices on the long term, and then we'll move on. This is the OEX, which is the S and P 100 index. It's uh, similar to the S and P 500, but you have the 100 largest companies. So these are your mega cap stocks, the big big companies. 
of the world, Apple and everything else. And you see just under these these lines here, you can, it's hard to make out. This was a bull market that lasted about six years. And I was using really, as I mentioned earlier, from 1994, uh, you know, up before then we had a deer market with the markets trading sideways. That's to the left of the chart there. Uh, but you have a pretty well-defined trend line, six-year bull market. Here's a bull market that lasted five, a little over five years, almost five years and three months. Uh, in this current one, if if the OEX topped, I guess, back in July 20th, um, then that one ran for six and a half years, and it's over. We haven't seen those highs yet. The S&P peaked back in, in the middle of 2015. Uh, in fact, the only thing, the NASDAQ itself peaked, but much later. The NASDAQ uh, is the only one. The mid caps, the s small caps, uh, the diversified indexes like the S&P 500, those all peaked back in the middle of uh, 2015 and have yet to see those highs. And in my opinion, probably won't uh, see those highs. I think we're going to go down and at some point in the coming months here, test the uh, August low or October lows and ultimately break those lows and um, keep moving lower. And if you look at the, you know, you just look at the chart, look at the scope of these bear markets. And, and, and remember that trading bear markets can be extremely lucrative. I know a lot of you aren't comfortable shorting stocks, and that's fine. Never trade outside your comfort level. Um, you know, in the last bear market, I had a field day going long and short. Um, counter trend rallies, whether you're in a bull or bear market, are very powerful and, and very lucrative to trade. And the nice thing about trading a, uh, a bear market or pullbacks, and one reason I like shorting so much, uh, you know, my niche is, is really identifying support levels and where prices are likely to reverse. When you're in a bull market that's going up and you're making new highs, you don't have any technical levels uh, because prices have never been there. So you don't have resistance levels to short off of when the market's going to new highs um, because you're at all-time highs. Uh, so it can, it can be very difficult. At that point, you just, you know, go long, follow the trend. Uh, but during uh, a bear market or a pullback, you have all these resistance levels. And we're looking at a weekly chart here. You're not going to see them here. I zoom into those on daily charts and in 60-minute charts. So uh, that's, you know, that's a lot of what I'll be looking at in, in 2016, uh, you know, uh, shorting and long opportunities. And, and remember, the stock market is a collection of thousands of stocks. And there's always stocks. There's stocks that have been in, in vicious bear markets now for years. And uh, those stocks may enter new bull markets. So, again, they'll always be long and short trading opportunities. And I expect that to continue in 2016. We looked at the large caps. Let's just run to the other end of the spectrum real quick and go down. And this is the Russell 2000 small cap index. Um, this chart is a, we're looking at a weekly chart, but just encompassing the bull market. So back here is a 2009 lows. Uh, the blue line, this is our primary bull market uptrend line. Very well def def uh, defined. We have the tag there, tag there, numerous tags, breakdown, back test. I mean, this is just, in my opinion, just a, a artwork and technical analysis as to how, the, how well the Russell has, has behaved on these trend lines. You know, broke down, back tested, pushed to new highs. A lot of that was because the NASDAQ was dragging the broad market up. Not to mention the fact this has been a central bank induced bull market. You know, the Fed, uh, the ECB, these global central banks just can, refusing to take the uh, foot off the pedal until recently. So, um, that's that's what happened. Uh, you can see that the Russell broke down. You know, in early or early to mid mid 2015, and has moved down since. I find these. I've shared this on the site for gosh over a year now. Um, these Fibonacci fan lines. If you look at the green lines, um, these aren't trend lines that I've drawn. These are Fib fan lines I put up, and you can see we had this initial uptrend. They just take a look at that chart. I won't spend too much time talking. You can see how well prices have acted off those, and we finally broken. And and when we were back here, I believe, you know, I forecasted that we would fall, catch support on that Fib fan line, which we did. We broke it, came back, back tested it, and came down, found support. Look at that was a strong sell off. Um, found support, moved up, and now we finally broke under that, and that's the final Fib fan line. So. Uh, that's you know evidence to me also that the the um, the Russell 2000 
is underway on a new bear market and that that bull market has seen its uh, best days. Uh, this is again chart that I've had up. I believe this is in the live charts page. You know, this remains my long term target 862. So we, we have a ways, way to go in the uh, small caps if uh, we're going to go to 862. Okay, so I just made the case based on really uh, the price and trend lines uh, showing you, you know, well, we looked at two things, really the duration, average duration of bull markets showing that the current one or we maybe, you know, hindsight will only prove us if that was a, the previous bull market, the 2009 to 2015 bull. We'll see. Maybe we'll make new highs 2016, then it, then it goes on. But um, so we know that the bull market has, has already exceeded, you know, the long end or or the average duration, I should say, well exceeded the average duration of a bull market. Did that a couple of years ago. Uh, now let's look at trends real quick. Uh, this is, again, these are things I've shared on the site um, many times. This is one of my favorite trend indicators, um, my longest term trend indicator. I use a, uh, on a monthly chart, I use a six and a 10 EMA. So that's a six period and 10 period exponential moving average on a monthly chart. I've put this up on on just about every major index the S&P 500 the Nasdaq uh, the results are very similar and I've shared this chart on the site so we're going back over 20 years here and as you can see what I've done the EMA pairs are up here the red and the blue line those are the 6 and 10 EMA and when they cross over in other words when the 6 EMA is trading above the 10 EMA we're in a bull market and it, you can barely make it out but behind there the very light uh, shaded solid line that's the Wilshire I have that sort of muted uh, so we don't obscure the the moving averages however I also place the Wilshire down here so you can see this is the Wilshire the black line and when the crossovers overs occur I have a histogram that I created uh, basically just take a MACD histogram on stock charts and Put your two moving average periods, so I have a 6 EMA, a 10 EMA, which are the defaults in the MACD, they use EMAs, and then you put a zero in on the um, on the last number there. And so what that's doing is that is showing you, it just gives you a visual, a histogram of when those two lines cross. So as you can see, I put the red line, and there's the history. Bull market got you out there. Told you we are in a bear market back in late 2000. Told you we were in a bear market all the way into 2003. Not not too far. Sure, it came several months after the lows, but if you look, you know, it's captured the bulk of every bull and bear market with one exception in over 20 years. Now, this chart only goes back 20 years. It keeps going. It's done a good job. We had a whipsaw signal here in 2011. Uh, most people aren't aware it wasn't talked about much. Just about every index, the small caps, mid caps, um, could be mistaken. I believe the NASDAQ, uh, a lot of those indexes did experience a bear market. They dropped over 20%. Now, the S&P 500 didn't. Uh, I don't believe the Dow did. But that was one heck of a correction and in many cases a bear market in a lot of mark, uh, indices. Uh Either way, I just want to point out that's when that whipsaw signal came. Um, but then, then that's why I have a different dash lines here to show you that nothing is perfect. Even recently, it signaled um, that we had a cross, and then we had one month where it crossed back positive, but we're negative again. Uh, we closed that way in, in uh, let's see, I believe in uh, uh, December. I also use down at the bottom here this ROC 12. I also use an ROC 13 sometimes to smooth it out. I'll, I'll use uh, either one. That's the rate of change. And that also does a great job. If you look when the ROC 12 is positive, it's above this zero line, you're in a bull market. And so this is a, a really a confirming or scrubbing factor. So if you wait for both the, the crossover, the bearish crossover on the 610 EMA pair, and the ROC 12, uh, that confirms. So you had confirmation there. See the red line. They both went positive at the same time. Told you you were in a bull market back here in 03. Uh, both went negative around the same time here. And if you notice here during the whipsaw period, the ROC 12 never confirmed. It, it bounced off that zero line. Uh, it actually crossed afterwards, but then the EMA pair was bullish. So point is, if you use both of these in conjunction, which I like to do, it, it 
one helps scrub out any of the false uh, or whipsaw signals on the other. And right now, what we're looking at, both are negative. We have the MACD 610, or I'm sure, I'm sorry, the, the 610 MACD pair, six, uh, I'm talking all over myself here, the six EMA, I'm sorry, on the monthly chart, trading below the 10 EMA right now. And of course, it's a monthly close. It's what's important if we're looking at a monthly chart. Uh, but we also have the uh, the ROC12 trading in negative territory. You have a value of zero, uh, 0 0.096. So there's that trend. Uh, we can look at a few others real quick. Same chart using the S&P 500 with the uh, monthly uh, 106 EMA pair. So we're not there yet. We did have a signal, a sell signal, a couple months ago. We're we're positive right now at this point in time. So any more downside, should the S&P uh, close negative this month, will almost certainly uh, trigger a bearish. Uh, crossover or at least a close with that 6 EMA under the 10. Uh, the ROC, I think I'm using it. This one I have the ROC 13, uh, and that's already confirming uh, a bear market's in sell mode or bearish trend mode. So again, what we're looking at here, now we're looking at trends, and uh, we'll, we'll zoom down so, to some uh, uh, shorter term trends here. Okay, those were monthly charts using a 10-6 EMA pair. These are weekly charts. So this is also a 20-year history. This is a different trend indicator. Works a little faster because we're using a weekly time frame and some faster EMAs. We have a 17 and a 43 EMA uh, up top. Same thing. I've replicated it down here with the uh, histograms. And you can see that that has also done a, a, a very good job. There's a whipsaw, the same whipsaw we had back in 2011. Um, and that, uh, since it's a faster signal, when you use these trend indicators, when you start moving down from a monthly to a weekly time frame to a daily time frame, and you start using faster AMAs, what, what will happen, it will give you a buy or sell signal earlier, so it'll help get you in on the trend, although it will be prone, more prone to whipsaw signals because it is faster moving. So a, a, you know, a quick correction in the market can trigger and will trigger the shorter term trend indicators to move to buy or sell signals. So if you're a long-term investor, you know, you're talking your 401k IRA money, that monthly chart, I don't think you can do, I don't think you can do better out there than just trading off that, you know, move into cash or short when you're in a confirmed bear market be long when when it's a confirmed bull market that's for those that don't trade actively and even this will help and of course like i said this will help give you a, a head start uh possible early signal you may be prone to a whipsaw signal if this indicator flips back bullish again you want to get back out uh, of your shorts or out of cash and maybe move back into the market but uh, right now as you can see uh the Wilshire has been on a sell signal with this uh, weekly pair for quite a while now, for several weeks. Here's that same 4317 weekly pair using the S&P 500. Uh, there's that whipsaw signal. Other than that, uh, a perfect history before the 2011 whipsaw signal. Uh, until recently, we we had a negative. I pointed this out on the site. We had a negative crossover, a bearish crossover. Uh, triggering a sell signal, but we move back up into positive territory, and again, we're just there. So really, um, you know, December can be a very uh, important month, at least helping to confirm these trend indicators. Uh, you know, if the markets remain below, the, if they fail to take out those 2015 highs. Uh, so, you know, I think what happens in January can very well impact what the rest of the year is going to look like. So if we have all these trend indicators flip back solidly to bearish, uh, we're going to head down more than likely that's going to put us near those October lows. And if those October lows give way, that's where I think we uh, can probably see that first true waterfall type sell off that you usually get in a bear market. Uh, and I'm talking something that, you know, larger than what we saw back in uh, the October sell off. Okay, I've talked about the Wilshire a lot because that is, again, the most representative index, in my opinion. The S&P, more follow, very widely followed. And, and, and the S&P, of course, is very representative of the economy because as far as sectors go, it's very well balanced. 
Um, speaking of sectors, I touched on the numbers earlier in the year, uh, early in this video on 2015, but uh, six out of the 10 major sectors in the economy were actually down for 2015. That was another a source that I didn't quote here, but wanted to point that out. Now, okay, so we talked on trend line breaks and, and really how the charts look. We looked at the trend indicators. And now I'll just wrap this up with really uh, market breadth. And, and again, these all formulate into my longer term opinion for those of you that say, well, okay, we broke that trend line, but, but, but. Um, this is a chart of the NASDAQ advanced decline issues. So advancing versus declining issues. And so up top, we have the NASDAQ composite. On the bottom, we have the NAAD, which is the, you know, once again, the NASDAQ advancing declining issues, the number of issues advancing versus declining. And I've pointed out, again, for years, the deteriorating breadth is, you know, a warning. It's always a warning sign, just like we saw when the market topped. Uh, you know, the scaling really doesn't do it justice here because this is that her, the vicious bear market right here back in 2000 from the 2007 highs to 2009 lows. So that might not look like it much, but you remember the NASDAQ lost about half its value here. It just has to do with the scaling of this chart. It doesn't look like a whole lot. Uh, so what you noticed is, is in the last couple of years, this is from 2000, mid-2004, you know, as the market was advancing, the NASDAQ was advancing, the uh advanced decline line was was uh, declining so that's negative divergence and that shows uh that the market's not healthy what happened then just as what's happened now is fewer and fewer stocks the amazons of the world the googles of the world uh, up until april 28th when it topped the apples of the world those stocks, those mega caps were carrying the market and, and responsible for virtually all the returns in the uh, in the NASDAQ. And I should focus on that because the NASDAQ has been the leading index throughout this entire bull market since the 2009 lows, even going on to make highs as recent. I think it was November when the NDX put in its its uh, made its all time highs. So we're looking at uh, a couple things I wanted to focus on that divergence and that's what kicked off and sparked this this the the bear market back in 2007. Now what I've done here is I've highlighted these periods. So this is the first big counter trend bounce we had after the market topped in in October of 2007 back here. So the the Nasdaq's topped sold off uh and again this was a powerful counter trend rally. Uh, just as we had here off the October lows, we had a very powerful counter trend rally. And if you look at it, it's really about the same, very close in duration. Um, now, what happens in a healthy market? You know, back here, we had a divergence. We had that big correction back in, remember, late 2011, where I mentioned a lot of those trend indicators flipped uh, bearish. You can see that after the correction, we had a rally, a relief rally. And what happened is, from that point, the the advanced decline line moved up, showing that there was broad participation in that rally. And from there, of course, we had you know some corrections along the way. And you expect this line to go down. By the way, when when the market drops, of course, you're going to see that AD line go down. Um, but what you want to see on a rising, on an advance like we have from this point here. Uh, when the when the Nasdaq is rising, you want to see that AD line going up. It's when that divergence happens. It shows you fewer and fewer stocks are participating. And so what I've highlighted here uh, is you see in that counter trend, that first major counter trend rally in the bear market in early 2008 here, uh, we had a sharp rally. But as you can see, the AD line didn't go anywhere. In fact, it just looked traded flat. So we didn't have participation. And that just proved to be, as I said, a bear market rally and then boom, the sharp sell off. Now that is exactly what's going on here. We had an extremely powerful rally off the October lows. And so far, well, up to that point, you can see the AD line did nothing. It traded sideways. And in fact, it looks just like it did back there in 2008. So you know, that's why I think we're at that same point. I think this is the first counter trend rally in a bear market. And, um, you know, the Elliotitians will say that's wave one down. You know, you have your wave two counter trend rally. And wave three, uh, if, if, it's, if 
you know, if that wave count is correct, uh, wave three is usually your most powerful impulsive wave. So we could be looking at, a, you know, some tremendous uh, profit potentials on the short side here uh, in the next few months. And you've got to be ready uh, in a bear market. Uh, unfortunately, it's you got to be quick or you're dead. Uh, you have to move fast. You have to get into these stocks because once they break down, they drop, you know, and I'm talking big name stocks can drop three, four, five plus percent a day and so you missed your entry you never get in and then when the darn things hit support the short covering the counter trend rallies are are powerful so um you know that's that's always been my niche is uh, you know trading on the short side i love trading on the long side as well um but i you know I, i've done a good as, as good a job as any i think as as is in getting into these stocks uh quickly right when they break down or shortly thereafter sometime even in advance of it and then being able to cover at the at the support levels where a uh, a bounce is likely uh, so that's that's I won't spend time. I could sit here and look at the advanced decline on the on the S&P 500, the percent of stocks making new highs, new lows, uh, the stocks trading above their 200 day moving average. All this I've covered over the last year. And again, this goes into my I'm spending so much time on this video because this is the beginning of the year and I wanted to share where my mindset is, where we're likely headed. And that will help formulate where I'm going to be looking. And in the next few weeks, what you'll see are a lot of trade ideas, individual trade ideas. And you'll probably see a, a substantial amount of short trade setups. Um, and as always, I'll, I'll try to include some uh, uh, sector and broad market shorts as well for those of you that prefer to trade uh, ETFs because the, for the diversity, um, the fact you don't have to worry about earning surprises and things like that. Okay, this has been Randy Finney with Right Side of the Chart, and I hope you enjoyed it.